<laughs> I think so. You get in the middle. I'm getting the end. <laughs> He's getting an end. <laughs> I'm not getting the middle. <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll allow me a brief introduction. <sighs> of course, again, our moderator tonight is Dr. Jeff Engel from the <coughs> Center of Presidential Studies here at SMU. And now for our Medal of Honor recipients. Immediately to my left, Lieutenant Tommy Norris joined the Navy in 1967 and soon entered to, into SEAL training. In April 1972, Lieutenant Norris was one of few remaining SEALs in Vietnam. When Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton was shot down behind enemy lines, aerial, aerial combat search and rescue operations failed, leading to the loss of five additional aircraft and the death of 11 or more airmen, two captured and three more down and needing rescue. Lieutenant Norris was tasked with mounting a ground operation to recover Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton, First Lieutenant Clark, and First Lieutenant Walker from behind enemy lines. Assisted by Vietnamese Sea Commando forces, he and Vietnamese Petty Officer Nguyen Van Kiet went more than 1.2 miles behind enemy lines and successfully rescued two of the downed American aviators. This story would later be told in movie Bat 21. His actions that day earned him our nation's greatest respect and the U.S. military's highest decoration, the Medal of Honor. Our second Medal of Honor recipient, Specialist Clarence Sasser, a Texas native, was drafted into the Army after giving up his college deferment at the University of Houston. He served as a combat medic during the Vietnam War. On 10 January 1968, his company was making an assault in Dien Tong Province, Republic of Vietnam when suddenly it was taken under heavy small arms, recoilless rifle, machine gun, and rocket fire from well-fortified enemy positions on three sides of the landing zone. During the first few minutes, over 30 casualties were sustained. Despite being wounded several times, Specialist Sasser rendered aid to multiple wounded soldiers, continually exposing himself to enemy fire while refusing medical attention for his own wounds. For his conspicuous gallantry and trepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Specialist Sasser would receive our nation's greatest respect and the U.S. military highest decoration, the Medal of Honor. Our third Medal of Honor recipient is Lieutenant Mike Thornton, who enlisted in the United States Navy in 1967. He would eventually enter into SEAL training, where upon graduation was assigned to SEAL Team 1. On October 31, 1972, then Petty Officer Thornton participated in a mission to capture prisoners and gather intelligence from the near the coast of Quang Tri Province, just south of the demilitarized zone. During the operation, his patrol suddenly came under heavy fire from a numerically superior force. Upon learning that his lieutenant had been hit by enemy fire and was believed to be dead, he returned through a hail of fire to the lieutenant's last position, quickly disposed of two enemy soldiers about to overrun the position, and it succeeded in removing the seriously wounded and unconscious lieutenant to the water's edge. He then towed his lieutenant seaward for approximately two hours until picked up by support craft. <laughs> Lieutenant Thornton, then Petty Officer Thornton, was directly responsible for saving Lieutenant Norris's life. Yes, Lieutenant Norris right here. And enabling the safe extraction of all patrol members. It's the only time in Medal of Honor history that a Medal of Honor recipient saved another Medal of Honor recipient's life. His action that day earned him the nation's greatest respect and the U.S. military's highest decoration, the Medal of Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, our guests. Thank you, General. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here. I have to say there are few occasions in my life where I uh, appreciate being on the stage and having the shortest introduction, but this is certainly the most appropriate moment uh, for that. So what we'd like to do for the next few moments is to give these gentlemen the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about their experience and more importantly, I think their ex perspective on the war, especially as our nation is reconsidering this conflict again, obviously in light of the the new film by Ken Burns. So I want to start with this question and put the context out, which is that when we think of Vietnam in our country, I think we actually think of it and remember it differently than other conflicts. And the best way to think about this is if you go to the Vietnam Memorial 
you see a series of names. We think of the war in many ways as individual stories. There's no other war that we have a national monument to that lists individuals on it the way that we do for Vietnam. So in that context, I'd, I'd really appreciate just starting with you, Lieutenant, and tell us how you found yourself there. What is the story that brought you to Vietnam, your individual story? Well, first of all, I was asked by my country, my nation, and uh, you know, I, none of us went to war for accolades or awards. We went there because our nation asked us to go to arms. You know, we live in the greatest nation in the world, and a lot of people take it for granted. But you know, for us to continue the freedoms that we enjoy so much in this great nation, we have to be able to support our nation as one. And uh, so when they asked, of course, my family was all in the military, and uh, when they asked, I knew I was going, but I always knew I wanted to be a Navy frogman. And uh, so I didn't hesitate to go at all as soon as I was asked. Uh, do I agree everything about Vietnam? No, I don't. Uh, I do say this about the media. A lot of stuff that I was getting sent to, from my parents to me was nothing that I was seeing. A lot of good things went over there. A lot of bad things went over there. Uh, war is a terrible, terrible thing. There's nothing good about it. If it was, I think we'd be in the war all the time. But the problem is, is that we have to, uh, I've been to 78 countries in the, my life, and I feel that we could all live in freedom. But there's such individuals in this world that's not allowed us to live in freedom. So uh, I continue to help support our nation and uh, what we do to uh, keep our nation free for our children. Yes, sir. As was mentioned, I was uh, uh, attending college and coming from a poor rural farm family uh, that wasn't any choice but to sometimes pick up work. Uh, and that era, uh, to continue or receive a deferment, you had to be pretty much full time. Well, full time and working didn't too much mesh at that point. The law of the land was that if you didn't meet that uh, criteria, then uh, you were subject to be drafted. Um, as I say, it was the law of the land, so I was drafted. Uh, I believe then, I believe now, that if you're gonna enjoy the benefits of a situation, then you gotta contribute to that situation. And that's what I did. I reported, I went to uh, basic training, was uh, sent to uh, medical aid man training, and from there to Vietnam. It was the law of the land. And from that point, uh, uh, I did what I call my duty. My duty was to be an aid man. Uh, we like to call ourselves combat medics. I'm sure there are some out there. But uh, from that point, that was my job. My job was to take care of my guys. And I like to think that that's what I did. Do you still recall your, your draft number? Well, that was before draft numbers. You oh. know. I think you're, you're referring to a little bit later on when okay. they gave, got a draft number and that determined your position in the draft. Well, then you, you were put in a category called 1A, 1 alpha, which meant you were... <laughs> you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> and once you got in that situation, that... that, that, that uh, the uh, category, you were gone. <laughs> you know, and, uh, I, 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 I won't dare sit here, sit here and say that I didn't know that. I knew that, and I didn't really have any objections with it. Again, I, I say I came from a, a poor rural farm family, and almost anything had to be better than that. <laughs> you know, if you're <laughs> You'll understand what the mill the, uh, the, the, the mill sixties was about. Almost anything was 
better than that. On top of it, there were promises made. That was the GI Bill, maybe. I could further my education. Uh, just one thing that we always uh, sort of felt over there was that you shook the dice and you rolled them. What you got is what you got. Lieutenant? Uh, I grew up in a middle class family. My father was served during World War II and instilled in me um, the belief that the respect for this country and for what it's given us. Um, and, you know, I fully expected to serve uh, my time in the military when that time came. And I also believe that, uh, that everyone should give back to this country something for what it's given us. Um, so my time came. I graduated from college at that time. We had we had the uh, we had the draft, and uh, um, depending on what your draft board, how how many people they had to get once you'd finish college. I mean, you're <laughs> the one A comes going to come up. So I uh, I volunteered as well. Um, when I deployed, I deployed because I was sent to do a job my country sent me to do, and I did that job to the best of my ability. Um, and uh, you see an awful lot of things in, con in combat. Um, uh, and uh, like Mike said, war, is, war is, uh, is not good, it's terrible. Um, but we will continue to see wars because somebody always wants what somebody else has and uh, uh, unfortunately um, we, we need to address that. And although war is not something that you ever want to have to become involved in, it's sometimes necessary for us to keep what we hold so dear. And uh, I, do, I will never regret for the time I spent uh, serving my country. Um, I did the job I was sent to do, and uh, I, uh, I truly am thankful for those young men and women that uh, serve us today. They're the ones that are keeping us free. Um, we fought at a time where, yes, we did back-to-back -to -back tours, but we didn't do them for 16 years like they're doing now. And, uh, and, uh, um, but thankfully, they're still out there. Small percentage of this country still volunteers. And, and uh, is out there willing to keep us free, and uh, God bless them. God bless this great country. So when I first uh, met these gentlemen this evening, and I, I asked and told them that I was going to give them the opportunity to tell their story, uh, their response was collectively, this is not our first rodeo. You know, we've, we've done this before. But I, I found myself wondering, as you hear the citations listed uh, and read aloud, something you've heard, I can't even imagine how many, many times you've heard that now. What do you think of as you hear the citation, but also what isn't in the citation? What memories do you have that don't make it into that official, official record that you think people should, should be aware of? Well, my citation was 18 pages long, and it was approximately a, a paragraph. But uh, at the end of the war, I've had several tours of Vietnam, and, and so this wasn't my first tour over there, as Tommy had several tours over there, too. Uh, uh, I, I do want to say something really quick before I forget. I want to say uh, thanks to all our uh, Vietnam veterans. I'm so proud of each and every one of you, and I hold you in a very special place, and I say welcome home, my brothers. And, uh, you know, because... What went on with us and the way we were treated, we can't change the damn past, but we sure can make the future better for these kids. It is through your leadership and what you've done for this great nation and worked hard, as Clarence was talking about and Tommy's talking about, it, we all, that we can hold our heads up high for what we did. As far as I'm concerned, could we have won the war? Yes, I felt we could have. If they had not, if they had tied our hands. Our hands were tied completely over there. I'd go to places to operate, as Tommy did, up north. They wouldn't clear the AOs for us, you know. We couldn't bomb uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. I mean, our, I knew Admiral Stockdale, Colonel Bud Day, many pilots. 
they couldn't bomb targets, so they knew that were you know that they, they could knock out, but they were told no, they couldn't do it. So you know when you get your hands tied, you know during our, our engagements, every time I went over there, our rules of engagements changed every damn time. If you see a gun, you can shoot the guy. If you see this guy, well, you first ask, well, are you a bad guy? Well, hell, he's carrying a gun, you know, <laughs> he ain't a bad guy. <laughs> Next time he had to shoot at you, well, I got bad news. I ain't gonna let anybody shoot at me first, because he may hit me, so I'm gonna shoot him first. But you know, it's, it's just, are we on our side, or are we on their side? And that's what I couldn't understand. And I hate to say this, we haven't learned anything through our history books. Let's go back when we were the War Department during World War II. Let's look at our history books from back there. Let's look at the bombings. Was there bad things on the north side and the south side? Yes, there were. Do I like uh, throwing it up on the TV set in front of us? You know, we have a, uh, we just did a, Tommy and I just did a thing in uh, Half Moon Bay. We had 103 young Navy SEALs up on the wall at Half Moon Bay at the Ritz Carlton that we go down and honor their fair, uh, uh, families and the, and the Gold Star families. You know, there's nothing good about war at all. But ladies and gentlemen, as Tommy just said, it's not never going to go away. We better get smart about it and learn how to defeat it. Because being passive is not the way to do it. If you're going to go in to take, take on a country, you better take it on with your, with your an attack. You better be very aggressive. You better not be passive and think it's going to go away. So I think that's what happened with us in Vietnam. I felt we were, our hands got tied, and the longer that we were there, the more they tied our hands. Uh, question is what, uh, I guess is in my mind that didn't make it into the citation and all of that. And I would respond that although it may signify, it does not say that I did my job and that's what my job was. I was a combat medic, medical aid man. <clears throat> when my guys got hurt, I was supposed to go regardless of the circumstances, I was supposed to go. They expected me to go. I know my daddy expected me to go because he was the one that imparted into me to do your job, do the best that you can do, and that constitutes doing your job. Now, that's what I would say that's not in there, is that I did my job. I think Clarence is absolutely right. You know, a citation is written um, to, to, to kind of um, shorten and summarize an action that was that was, it happened. Um, if it's a classified action, of course, some of that stuff's going to be left out and it's going to be uh, uh, even more shortened. But, um, uh, you know, what was in the citation, and I, I don't know that I'd want to put anything other in there because, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's personally satisfactory, I mean, it's suitable to, uh, to explain, a, 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 you know, a, a, three-day operation, I guess, but um, uh, that's, the citation, to me, and I think like, I, I know Mike and Clarence feel the same way, we don't feel like we deserve the honor we, we were bestowed. Um, we do wear it, we're, I guess we're temporary custodians of it, um, and we wear it for all those that, uh, that never came back and, uh, and uh, for those who were never recognized. And um, uh, yeah, there's, there's no way you're gonna put that into a citation. So, um, you know, uh, we are thankful for, for all those people that have served and, and continue to serve today, and particularly the Vietnam vets that are here. Thank you so much for
doing the job that you did while you were there. So given that you've all come here tonight, um, I'm going to presume that not only are you interested in remembering this crucial part of our nation's history, but also, at least in some portion, interested in Ken Burns's representation of it. And it's, it's striking when watching those clips, and not so much watching the clips, but listening to the reaction of the audience, there's a different reaction for this film than when, say, the Civil War film is portrayed, honestly, because I think there's nobody around from the Civil War that remembers that. <laughs> what we hear tonight from those clips are, frankly, a lot of sighs. Uh, not so much laments, but people who are just overcome with emotion in many ways, but also overcome with the idea that perhaps, as the film said, the government was not necessarily telling them the full story, or as you pointed out, sir, giving them the full opportunity in the field to, to do what they wanted. And I'm, I'm curious how your, what your reaction is when you see these, these clips and what your reaction is when people tell you their thoughts about the war. I, I, uh, I'm from the mountains of South Carolina. My father, is, as we all say, my father was a sixth grade education. He was my greatest mentor, my greatest hero, my greatest everything. And, uh, um, but when, when we came back, I felt when I came home, I was a hero. You know, as Tommy says, none of us think we deserve the medal, never will think we deserve the medal. Now, Tommy thinks I deserve my medal because I got it. It's particularly good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, um, like I say, you come back, and I'd watch it on TV because it was it was brought in the living room. Now, did I agree with everything Walter Cronkite was saying? No, I didn't. I had the great. I was ordered, ordered, to take a C, two CBS crews out one time on an operation, and uh, and I was trying to take them somewhere safe because I, I sure didn't want to be the guy that got the CBS crew killed. Well, we got in a firefight, and they were running, and I was running, and everybody else was running, because we were always, oh, man, because we'd work in very, very small units, you know. And um, I dropped his camera, and I just kept running. I just stepped on the camera and kept running. <laughs> and he uh, said, where's my camera? I said, you dropped it. I ain't going back for it, you know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's, uh, I felt for the, our veterans. I, I felt how they got, came back, and I'd see so many of them being protest on and in the airports and stuff like that. And uh, I, I felt that they were mistreated all the way around. But like I said, when I went home in the mountains of South Carolina, everybody treated us like heroes. They loved their men, you know. In different parts of the country, it was, it was different, you know. I mean, it's like the great state of Texas. I mean, they treat everybody great here and stuff like that. Now, if I was in Chicago, I might have been a little bit different up there, or even Berkeley. I mean, you know. So I mean, uh, so, it's noted, been Berkeley. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I uh, you can see the difference, like you just said. There aren't a whole lot of TV sets in during the Civil War, but you know that was the greatest loss of life ever in the history of America. So you got it, buddy. <laughs> oh, please. Well, I understand the film and what it's showing, but I don't know that the lies or the misrepresentations, I guess we should call it, would have meant anything to me then. Uh, I was under a penalty to either come or face the consequences. And, 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 and to me, that was simply it, either go or face the consequences. Uh, I felt then, as, and I still feel now, that uh, if, you, if you want to benefit from a situation, you've got to participate in that situation. Uh, meaning that if I call myself an American, then I got to do the things that the Americans do. And that's obey the laws. Well, I looked at it then. I don't know that it would have made any difference. I know that the guys over there probably uh, needed me 
<laughs> at least I felt that, that my job was as a medical aid man, that I was needed, was necessary. From that point on, I think that's all that uh, mattered to me at that point in time. I don't, and I don't know that it would be different now. Yes, sir. Um. <clears throat> First thing I want to say, did you notice Ken's birds are wearing the same tie I've got? <laughs> <laughs> got awful good taste in clothing. <laughs> well played, well played. Um, you know, it's interesting to see uh, the, um, the people he's interviewed regarding this. Um, and I'm gonna be particularly interested in seeing what his, what his uh, feeling for the outcome of, you know, at the end of this series. Um, I've only seen one section of it, so I can't really speak about it other than that, but I'm kind of going to be interested to see how he ties it up and what his overall um, opinion was. As far as um, uh, whether things were, were, were um, handled or things we didn't hear about or know about what the administration was doing didn't affect me one bit. Just, I think all of us, we were, we, we were sent to do a job that was what we, that's what we looked at. That, that's the only thing that we were concerned with, that and keeping our people safe. Um, I knew back from my very first tour that a lot of the intelligence that was being gathered and being sent back to, um, and even early on before my time, was not being reacted on according to the intelligence that was coming in because that's not what was one to be that's not what the higher ups wanted to hear. They wanted to hear we were we were being successful. There wasn't that much of an invasive force, um, and, it, and it's, that wasn't really what was happening. Um, but that wasn't my concern when I was. My concern was to do the job I was sent to do. However, I knew it was very evident from my first tour that if the th if we weren't allowed to. Um, fight the war, or fight that, excuse me, it was a conflict. Um, <laughs> goodness gracious. Um, with the full force that we had the capability of using, then it was just a holding action. We, we were never going to be able to do anything more than just a holding action until we finally withdrew. That was pretty evident. Um, but that did not prevent me from doing a job that I'm doing when I'm over there, because that was not what I was sent to do. And um, you may ask me why I went over a second time if that's the way I felt. Because I, I believed in what I was being sent to do was very worthwhile. Um, so that's why, why I did. But, uh, um, you know, I don't, as far as, um, and it's going to be interesting to see the, his whole series because I like to see how it all comes out. But uh, and I know he's interviewing both sides, and that'll be interesting as well. I had an opportunity to go to Vietnam in 2005. They were doing a documentary on the mission that I ran. And um, um, I, so I had a chance to see the people that were there and, I, and, and communicate with them. And um, there was a political person who was kind of in charge of the North Vietnamese or that whole um, uh, episode when they were filming, and they had brought in two of the officers that were in charge of the units that I had to penetrate through. There was over 30,000 North Vietnamese units there that I had to work through. And um, they did not want to be there. They hated us. You could see very readily that they did. But by the time that people doing the interviews were, were not, you know, born or, or um, and knew much about the Vietnam War, and they would ask questions, and I would ask, a, answer them as to why we reacted the way we did and what the North Vietnamese were doing that caused us to do what we were doing. And by the third day, these officers started asking me questions directly before they'd ask them through the interpreters as if the interpreter was asking me the question. Now they're asking them directly because they wanted to hear the response that I had. And by the time we left, um, at the end of that week, um, one of them invited us over to his house for lunch. Now understand that when they started out, they didn't want, they want anything to do with us. They didn't want to be near us. They were there because that political was telling them to. And the other thing he was trying to solicit from us was some sympathy or sorrow for the fact of what the United States had done. 
And, um, and uh, on various occasions, he, they attempted that. But um, <laughs> he certainly wasn't going to get that from me, and, and uh, um, uh, nor the other people that were there. But uh, I was also able to talk to some of the locals. My interpreter was obviously North Vietnamese, Vietnamese who had lost kids or lost her, some of her family by our bombing. And, um, she came over on about the fourth day. We were down in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City now, and asked me if I'd go talk to her brother. Her brother ran a restaurant uh, dance area, and I, and I spent probably four hours talking to this kid. And he was younger generation, and all he wanted to know was, what's the outside world like? You know, what's America like? What's the outside world like? And I want to know because we're not told. We don't know anything other than what we read or are told. And there's a great deal of um, um, people now from all over the world that come and visit Vietnam. And uh, um, uh, so it's opening up a, quite a bit. And he wanted to know what, what's it like? I mean, he, they were, and the younger kids for the pretty much as a whole were very open to uh, the Americans that were there. And uh, which is kind of neat to see in a, in a way, but I also was able to talk to some of the people at some of their um, uh, museums, and of course, as you would expect, everything there is very much how they won, and we didn't. And uh, um, uh, but some of the people, um, the people um, that are the guides in this were RVN people, Republican Vietnam people who were watched over by others. And I was able to get one of them aside and, and ask him. And he said, I asked him how life was. And he says, not good. He says, we are monitored all the time. We're watched all the time. Um, we don't have the freedoms that most of the North Vietnamese people have. And if, I, if this fellow sees me talking to you, he's going to want an explanation. And I, you know, I'll probably get in trouble for it. So that was sad to see. but. Uh, interesting to see was that the younger people there uh, were more open. They, they wanted to know what the outside world was like. And of course, they're, they're, it's much, much changed now than when I was there. You know, you, you preface my next question. Um, I, I remember you've all mentioned your fathers, so I'll mention mine, um, who also served in the Army during this time. And I went to Vietnam in 2004 as a historian. And I remember having this, this fascinating conversation with him where he said, you know, I can't imagine from my generation anybody going there as a tourist. That's not something we thought about when we were 18, 19, 20 years old. Tourism was not high on the Vietnam list. Um, <laughs> and I'm curious then, have either of you, you already mentioned, sir, but have either of you had the opportunity to go back? Do you have interest? And what do you think about the, the sense of the country now? I, I, I... Well, if you, you read everything they're doing, you look at the stock exchange, who want to be just like America? I mean, I mean, they're a thriving country over there right now. Uh, you know, uh, I just want to go back one thing about this thing you were asking about this. You, you know, what, there was a lot of good things done in Vietnam. I mean, I, I lived with the Vietnamese almost all my tours over there. And uh, we took care of their families, we medically wise. Uh, I had, I had one time I had the Kit Carson Scouts. The Kit Carson Scouts are ex NVA and NVC. I took care of them like they were my own. I got them uniforms, I got them food, I bring in medics like Clarence. They'd give them, they did uh, twice a week. We'd take care of those like that. I helped adopt families, stuff like that. Uh, Orphanages, we set up orphanages. And we set up orphanages. We did a lot of stuff over there. But you don't see none of that on there. It's just about you know, the bad things, and you know, and like I say, war is bad, you know, but there's a lot of good things, you know, and when we left that country, we pour, we put money into that country now today, you know, but tries, we'd like to see them strive to be a better country and a better, and a better world for everybody. But you know, it's like all the LDN and Vietnamese SEALs, we stayed in SEAL Team 1 until we got every one of those guys back out alive. I sponsored actually Two of the SEALs that were with Tommy and I, one's a fisherman up in uh, Washington State, the other one taught school for 20 years in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in a community college. So, you know, we don't give up on them. And, and, and the NVA, I have no bad feelings against them. They were doing their job that they were asked to do 
We were doing our job that we were asked to do. And if you listen to what Clarence says and Tommy, it was taking care of each other, mm -hmm. taking care of our other veterans out here in, the, in this thing. And that's what usually war is about. You know, it's not the politics, it's not that. We know that we're looking for support. And I don't see that from what uh, Mr. Burns' thing is. He doesn't talk about anything, that, the good things that we did over in Vietnam. I'll let it go at that. Sir, did you want to? I, I haven't been back. Uh, I really hold no desire to go back, not, not for any other reason other than this, just that was a passing part of my life. I wish them well. Uh, as Mike say, I uh, understand the, that they were doing what they were told to do as well as I was doing what I was told to do. Uh, but as for having been back in the country since then, no, I haven't. But I have mixed emotions about whether I would go back now. I, I probably would because of the Medal of Honor, but I don't really hold any desire to go back for no girl's reason or any other reason other than it's just not at that point in my life now. Well, we have some time for some questions from you uh, at this point. Um, we do have some microphones, I believe, are going to be coming down. Um, and if you wouldn't mind uh, raising your hand and if you have a question to ask or standing up, uh, and we'll get some microphones. I see a gentleman down here in the front. Uh, if you wouldn't mind waiting for the microphone just so that everybody can, can hear you. Uh, I've, I've read your book about you and Mike's experience in Vietnam, and there's uh, one thing that I find extremely interesting about, about you, Tommy. The, the, in talking with people who know you, fear is not part of one of your emotions. <laughs> and I remember when I was four or five years old, and I guess I misbehaved at church. My dad said, you're going to get a spanking when you come home. And I've known fear ever since then. I think it's, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's totally fascinating that a and I'm not sure it's good or bad in a, in a combat situation, but, but fear is not part of your makeup. And when did you find out that you didn't possess it? Jimmy, I don't know if it, it was fear of him or stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think you have time for it uh, in combat. You just don't. Yeah. Uh, you set that aside. It's, it's, uh, you, you can't afford to, because if you do, you won't operate the next day. Um, you kind of just push that aside. Uh, there is times after after ops when you come back and you're trying to review, you know, what you should have done differently or whatever. You kind of go, "Good Lord, we, we made it out of that one, didn't we?" <laughs> Whew! But you don't really think on it, and you can't. Um, you know, I, I and I think I, you know people say fear is a, is you know a part of life and a good thing, and, and I'm sure that that may be true, but. Um, you can't let it defeat you, and um, and sometimes that's what fear does to people. Uh, they're so afraid that they can't finish or complete uh, something that they don't really aggressively attack it. And I was just brought up differently. I was brought up to you know believe I could do whatever it is I set my mind to doing, and uh, um, I don't let a whole lot of stuff get in the way. And um, that's kind of the way I've led my life, and, and uh, I, I, I think I mean, it certainly hasn't um, been detrimental to me. Um, uh, you know, the only thing is, if I, if I duck faster, I wouldn't be. <laughs> Mike would have had to carry me out, but <laughs> I, it's much better me getting shot than him. I had to pick that son of a gun up and carry him out. That'd been a load. <laughs> But uh, I hope that answers your question. I, yeah, please. I don't think fear plays a part in circumstances such as what we were involved in. If it did, I don't believe you would ever do it because you know that it's bad. It's bad out there. And if you fear uh, something that's bad, then it, it'll never get accomplished. And. Uh, 
the Melibana is based on <laughs> an individual doing things that uh, most people, when you consider fear, wouldn't do. Uh, I, I agree with Clarence 100%. I mean, I was 500 yards away from Tommy, and we had already, I'd already been wounded seven times myself. And, uh, and when they came back and said Tommy was dead and they grabbed me, I said, stay here. I'm going back for Tommy. It wasn't the fear stopping me. It was, <clears throat> it was the love and the camaraderie I had for that man right there. Yeah, you know me and, and so I don't care if it was fear or anything else, it wasn't going to stop me going back to get him. And when I picked Tommy up, I thought he was dead. I mean, and uh, the first round came in and blew us 25 feet. We were on top of this big bunker, blew us 25 feet off. And he landed, he, I saw him flying off my shoulders and I went, went over and went to pick him up again. And he said, it might, buddy, because the whole side of, so his whole uh, left side of his head was completely gone. I mean, his brain was, you know, his skull was gone and everything. So, um, so I, I don't think you, you never, as Tommy says and, and Clarence, you never think of fear through all my tours. If you got to take that fear and turn it into something positive. Something you have to do. What am I going to do? Move, move, move. Or run, run, run. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a lot easier, it's a lot harder hitting a moving target than it is this one standing there freared. <laughs> but, but for sure, somebody has to do something. Yeah, that's right. Well, let me take that advice and keep moving. Um, another question from the audience? I think you, you've intimidated them. Here's one right there. Could you share with us your experiences after the war, what you did after the military? Sure. Um, I guess I can start out. I <laughs> spent a number of years in the hospital being re <laughs> getting re repaired. I kept showing pictures of Robert Redford and those guys, and they went, you don't have a chance. But uh, um, after I was completed with my surgery, I became an FBI agent. I served 20 years with the FBI. An incredible career, it really was. Um, Nothing like television and movie shows, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and a lot of dedicated people doing a, working very hard to uh, um, enforce the federal federal laws of our country. But uh, um, it was it was a fun career. I mean, I really really enjoyed it. I mean, good lord, they gave you gave me a car, put gas in it, let me let, let me arrest and lock up people, and they paid me to do it. I mean, jeez. <laughs> I guess. My uh, after I returned and uh, uh, took a couple a couple of years to uh, to heal and everything, I did return to college. Uh, got married, raised three sons, all of whom I'm very very proud of. Uh, uh, a couple of federal employees now and. Uh, I just picked, uh, I like to think I picked up what was left of my life, started a new one, and went on about my business. I am particularly proud of my sons. Uh, my wife was killed by a drunk driver, so, you know, I understand that <laughs> and don't like that, but uh, I'm particularly proud of my sons. None of them chose to go into the military. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't say that I blame them. I, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted what they wanted. There you go. Um, I made a military career I stayed in uh, for almost 26 years. And uh, I was one of the original 10 that started SEAL Team 6 in 1980. Of course, I did a lot of traveling with them on around and actually when Tommy was in the FBI, I trained him. <laughs> you certainly gave me a lot of clothes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I gave a lot of good clothes, yeah. So, yeah but uh, I love the military and I, I, when they retired me, I was kind of upset, but it was just another page in, in, in your chapter of life and you turn that page and you move on and do something else. And uh, 
I moved to, from South Carolina, there was a whole lot of jobs going on there, and I moved to the great state of Texas, and uh, I said, well, I can be one of two things, a hitman for the mafia, or uh, start a small security company. So I started a small security company. <laughs> we proud that. Have you, have you ever reconsidered that decision? <laughs> <laughs> it's bad enough to know who your enemies are. You don't know the good guys or the bad guys are trying to shoot you, but it, uh, but, but um, I, I did, like I say, the, the, we live in the greatest country in the world. And, uh, please don't never take that for, uh, for granted. Another question? Do any of the vets have a question for us? Well, that was really my question. I know you guys are still serving your country. And I know Lieutenant Thornton has a foundation and goes around all time helping other people and other vets. And so that was kind of my question. but. Since that was, since you've answered that, uh, I guess I'd, I'd like to ask this, uh, Lieutenant Thornton. When you were pulling Lieutenant Norris out to sea, I think also one of the Vietnamese commandos, wasn't it? Weren't you pulling two people? Yes, sir. I was carrying uh, Quan. He was shot through his right buttocks, and part of his uh, femur muscle was gone. And I had him in front of me and had Tommy on my back. And, uh, uh, and then... I assume you saw the cruiser moving away, your support, and you kept still swimming out to sea. How did you know that someone was going to be there to pick you up? And what were you thinking? Well, we had a up? great young man by the name of Bill Woodruff, uh, and he we always put a seal on the insertion and extraction craft. And even though Billy said, uh, actually, the word got back, uh, the young Vietnamese officer had left earlier and Bill found him and he was debriefing him and he said Tommy was dead and I was missing in action. And the other two Vietnamese SEALs were out there. But I had handpicked those two Vietnamese SEALs uh, personally. And uh, they had been in many firefights. Uh, I know little Quan says, Mike, I never work with you no more, no more. And I said, why? He said, I always get shot. I <laughs> But I said, I always bring you back alive. He said, good thing, good thing. <laughs> well, thank all of you for your service to your country. Thank you, sir. It. Another question? I think I actually see somebody in the back who has a question. Did you all hear the question? Yeah, it's a uh, traumatic brain injury. I, I had that. Yeah, PhD. <laughs> <laughs> You're traumatic enough. I think we all. I think we all had it. I. Uh, I after after uh, college, I uh, went to work for the Department of Veteran Affairs, the uh, Houston Regional Office, and I processed disability claims for the returning veterans. I was a claims examiner all, uh, all, all the way up to deciding disability issues. And uh, those were uh, considerations that we took in, 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 into uh, our decisions. Uh, PTSD was formally declared a, a disability within the rules of VA in the early 80s, or middle 80s, let's say. And from that point, uh, when you say traumatic brain injuries, uh, 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 the, the Department of Veteran Affairs looked at them and called it uh, <laughs> exactly that traumatic brain injuries, but uh, they were a more, a, a lesser version or a, a greater version, let's say, of uh, the concussion issue that we see now. Uh, the, and, I'm, and I may know no, no, nothing meant, the NFL with its concussion in, uh, <laughs> with his concussion issues, uh, should have went to the military. The military is the foremost authority on head injuries. 
such as what Tommy had, <laughs> such, as, such as what I had when a, when a, when a AK round bounced off of my head. Hard-headed. Yeah, but that's what Daddy always said I was hard-headed. <laughs> but uh, thanks for the question, and that was part of what went on during that, during that time. And I call, I yeah, yeah, I, I call it PTS. I don't put a D on it. It's a disorder. <laughs> let it become a disorder. You know, you gotta you, you gotta fight your demons, and uh, we yeah. all we all have them in this room. I mean, something you know, and uh, but you you have to want to help yourself so before anybody else can help you. Yeah. Well, with any issue, the body is a marvelous machine. Him that bees knew what he was doing when he put us together. If you'll give it time, ride it out, it will heal itself. And I, that's probably, the, in my mind, the most profound thing I will say. <laughs> <laughs> but in Tommy's case, the brain does not regrow, regrows and start growth again. So he's, in, he's behind the cloud right now. No, 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 no. Uh, it, to answer your question, obviously, it is a very um, yes. Uh, concerning issue, and we've had a number of suicides, much more than we'd ever want to want to think would occur within the people that served in the military. But um, I think, like like Mike and, and Clarence both said, um, it's how you handle it. Some people can handle it easier than others, um, and sometimes it takes quite a while to be able to adjust and and. Uh, um, uh, let some of those issues uh, resolve. Um, some people, it may, it may never, um, but at least now we recognize it and uh, we're taking steps to try and, and heal, help those that have the, those problems. Um, sadly, we didn't see it. You know, Jesus has been happening in every war. He's called it uh, shell shock. <laughs> but. Uh, um, Battle yeah, it is. Team. Battle for team, team, whatever. But um, it is a real issue, and, and um, it's something that, that continually needs to be addressed. But as Medals of Honor recipients, we're very aware of the situation, and we all have made, gone out to all these kids, and we've made films and stuff to say, hey, everybody has this, so don't be afraid to raise the flag. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And the, every one of us are wearing our uniforms or our medals around our neck, and we talk to these kids and let them know that because we're very aware of the situation. We're going to help in any way we can. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, but like I say, they got to want to help themselves. They have to take that step forward. So uh, we have time. I have a question. What's that? What's that? Good. Speaking of talking to kids, what do you tell young men and women? who ask you about serving in the military today? I, I personally, uh, I'll, Tommy, you go first. Okay, <laughs> I'll, well, I'll field that one. Um, you know, there's a lot of kids that, you know, when they're, when they're particularly, particularly uh, high school age, but we talk to kids even from elementary school on up, but, um, you know, some of them have goals already set. They're, you know, they're gonna go to college or they have a, a life path, but there's so many that do not. And we try to encourage them to um, at least uh, consider the military as, a, as an option because what you're going to gain is going to put you miles ahead of your fellow uh, students that don't go. Um, it's going to give you experiences and, and um, build your, your character, build your... your, your um, your ability to uh, um, uh, resolve problems, um, uh, give you some responsibilities that you may not have had before, um, but prepare you for anything you're going to encounter later in life. So yes, we do try to encourage uh, the young men and women in our educational system to consider that. Um, and like, like we've all said, we think everyone should give back in some way to this country. It doesn't have to be the military, but uh, at least uh, 
consider that as, a, as an avenue if you really don't know what else you want to do. Um, and I think probably all of us yes. look at it in that regard. Anything other you want? I, I, uh, I have always encouraged the, 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 uh, the young people that I speak with to join the military services. Uh, it offers a way out to a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, kids that have no other way out if they'll just consider it and take it. Uh, it's a good living now. It's not like when we all went in there where it was, what was it, $90 a month? $86. $86 a month. It's a, actually a good living now. And you learn a lot that you would never have learned any other way. It puts you ahead on any job that you might, uh, might uh, fall into than anybody else that came along, along with you. So yeah, I do encourage it. I encourage it every day. I, where, down where I live, I uh, am well known down there and that I support the military. If you got a problem, come talk to me. Yeah, and it's kind of like we're doing right now. You know, a lot of people are hungry to find out what goes on. We don't really teach history like we used to as we were growing up in, in, in the country. Uh, but, you know, uh, my, I guess I told you my father was my greatest mentor. I wasn't a bad kid growing up. I, uh, I had dyslexia really bad, but I got, I was, say I was, uh, I don't know, what do you call it, Tommy? Just say I got in a little <laughs> trouble, you know. And my dad and the, the juvenile judge, I'm not proud to say this, but I'm not proud, I'm not afraid to tell kids this, that the juvenile judge and my dad set up a thing, and uh, I was going to join the armed services and I just didn't know it yet because I knew I was 1A. And uh, he said, Mike, what did I tell you if you came in front of me again? I got in a fight and I messed a guy up a little bit, big deal. He should never sucker punch me. But, uh, but uh, so you said you'll send me to reform school. And he said, yep. But I'm going to give you make your first decision in your life. I said, I want you to do an about face. And I came to about face and I turned around and there were the recruiters were right there. <laughs> <laughs> and Ned Johnson was a second class, uh, second class petty officer, and he was a Navy recruiter. And I turned around and I came a hand salute. I've always wanted to be a Navy frogman, sir, and put it <laughs> like that. He said, "Go sign those papers." <laughs> so my father, and he never told me about it till almost 20 years after I'd been in the Navy. So uh, <laughs> he said, uh, and uh, and it was everything. It was my education. It was. Travel. It was, you know, it's, you know, Daddy always said, "You take care of your people. Your people will take care of you." And I still use those rules today. That's the reason my wife and I travel 262 a day to help these kids that can't help themselves. And in a way of our foundation, I, I think that's the reason why Tommy and I write this book. I think this gentleman and why we've all been friends for 40 something years. I'm 40, almost 50 years now. So you know, it's that camaraderie and love for each other. You know, and. Uh, and it, it was the, uh, my parents gave me the basis. The military helped me move forward with those bases. Well, we have time for uh, just one more question. Uh, this gentleman, I think, is going to attack me on the way out if I don't give him the microphone. <laughs> oh, you don't want to mess with him. Is there a microphone coming? I think I can okay. Seals of today versus your kingdom. And uh, can you give us an observation of what you see? 
Yeah, I, I, I'm so very proud of those kids. They took the baton from Tommy and I, but it's not just the Navy SEALs, it's the, all the armed services. These kids are so bright, so brilliant. I mean, they're talented. You know, they, they're not drafted. They come in the military because they want to do something for this country. They have that positive attitude. And I tell you, they're a lot smarter than I was ever. And, and Clarence and Tommy both, because these kids, what they have to do to learn, just with the, all the electronics and stuff. I mean, my granddaughter's put my apps on my phone or my beautiful wife, because I haven't figured it out yet. Can you hear me now is all I know I want to hear. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, We'd have been happy with a GPS and a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in <laughs> Vietnam, I'd have loved to have a GPS and cell phone, because I... But uh, I, I'm very proud of our event. I travel all over the country, and I talk to the military. I mean, I'm down at Fort Bliss, Colleen. Uh, 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 I'm out with all the SEAL teams all around, you know, and I'm very proud of the Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 6. I just, I just say, uh, you know, you keep a low key. You have a responsibility. You don't need to be talking about your operations. You don't need to be writing books. I mean, and my... Myself and our good friend Eric Olson, we've traveled around to try to talk to these young seals. You know, don't give away secrets. I mean, we never did. We never talked about our operations until they had been declassified after 25 years. And uh, there are still classified stuff on some of the things that I did. But uh, you know, but I, I am so proud of our military. I, they're, they're the best. They're the best in the world right now. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you, but before doing that, uh, two pieces of housekeeping. Uh, the first is if you would like to hear more and learn more about some of these stories, um, this book uh, written by these gentlemen is for sale, as well as another one uh, by a um, Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation, which I believe also goes uh, to their charity. So if you have the opportunity on your way out, please think of picking up one or both of those books. And then also, if you, have the, if you are so inclined, um, our Center for Presidential History is in the business of recording history, recording memories, and in particular recording what people think about history. So we have some cameras set up outside. Uh, if you want to sit down and give your thoughts to the camera for three or four minutes of what you remember about Vietnam or what you want subsequent generations to learn about Vietnam, uh, we'd love to hear them and we put them in the archive for future researchers and for our students to use. Um, so if you want to be memorialized that way, that's a great way. So uh, if you would, please, uh, join me in thanking these gentlemen. And gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and your service.